Hi, I'm the Reverend Roger Griffin. I am a minister in the Anglican Diocese of the Southwest with the ACNA. I'm honored to be the area dean for Mexico, and I'm also a Sam's missionary. Thank you so much for taking a few minutes to view this video. I hope you find it helpful and, and hopefully maybe even a little bit challenging. It is called The Fusion of Two Cultures. This is a very famous painting here in Mexico. It's called The Fusion of Two Cultures. It is by uh, an artist named Jorge Gonzalez, and it, and it, like I say, it's very famous, and it hangs in the presidential palace in Mexico City. And it kind of depicts uh, the, the fusion of the Spanish culture and the indigenous culture there. And it's a reminder to me, I, I love the painting, and it's a reminder to me more than anything of, of things we want to avoid when we're working cross-culturally. You know, when we first came to Mexico many years ago, <clears throat> like most North Americans, I thought I knew all about Mexico, or at least enough about Mexico, you know, sombreros, Cancun, uh, you know, Cinco de Mayo, and after all, who doesn't like tacos, right? You know, and it was fun, kind of funny in my youthful zeal, I couldn't understand why we would need nine whole months of language training and cultural indoctrination before going to the mission field. But after living in Mexico City for a couple of years, I realized that nine months of training was not nearly enough. I began to understand that there were really very important differences between our cultures, differences more than just language and cuisine, very deep differences, differences that really should be understood by those of us who desire to reach our Mexican neighbors. With this in mind, I want to take some time and do a little history lesson for you and, and, uh, and talk about the differences between our cultures. So let's talk about Mexican history a bit. No one really knows where they came from. All we really know is they wandered down from the north across several several decades or maybe even centuries, uh, probably down from the American Northwest. They were uncivilized mercenaries. They were unruly Spartans. They were looking for a homeland. By the year 1250, they had wandered into the Valley of Mexico along the shores of Lake Texcoco, the site of modern Mexico City. It wasn't long before the neighboring tribes grew very impatient with their outrageous and abusive behavior and banished them to a little mud island in the middle of Lake Texcoco. Knowing that all there was in the island were rattlesnakes and cactus, the tribal leaders on, on the, around the lake were very confident that they had seen the last of these troublemakers. But much to their surprise, a few years later, they found that instead of dying off, these tenacious warriors were actually thriving on a diet a, a rattlesnake and cactus. <clears throat> By the time Christopher Columbus had discovered the New World in 1492, this obscure, warlike little tribe had conquered central Mexico. They had built a magnificent city on that mud island. They had constructed palaces and temples, aqueducts and highways to the far corners of their, of their kingdom. They were trading regularly with merchants as far north as the American Northwest, and as far south as Peru. These were the mighty Aztecs, or the Mexica, as they called themselves. In the meantime, in Northern Europe, the Renaissance is in full swing, and the Reformation is rumbling. The arts and the economy are beginning to flourish, and a spirit of optimism is in the air. But in Spain, in the Iberian Peninsula, also in 1492, a different type of Renaissance is happening. You see, Spain, by 1492, had just completed 700 years of bloody crusades and warfare to retake the peninsula from the, Moor, from the, uh, from the Moors, who had dominated the region for, for those 700 years. And they had finally uh, defeated the last stronghold in Grenada. So after seven years, excuse me, after seven centuries of war, Spain is at last staunchly united and totally committed to the Holy See of Rome. And it's deeply committed to the Inquisition, expelling, converting, or eliminating all non-Catholics from their land. Now into this callous and medieval culture, news began to come back from the new world. Tales of conquest and adventure, fame and fortune, cities of gold and fountains of youth. And these tales found a very welcome home in the ears of a young Hernan Cortez. Hungry for adventure, Cortez arrived in the Dominican Republic at the age of 18 and began to build his career and his fame. Meanwhile, back in Mexico City, Tenochtitlan 
Moctezuma, the Aztec king, began hearing reports of large, huge floating houses floating across the ocean towards the coast. These houses carrying strange looking men, men that had shiny bodies and white faces with beards. There was also huge, never before seen creatures. Some even appeared to be half human and half animal with four legs on the bottom and the torso of one of these shiny men on top. Moctezuma was understandably troubled. You see, Aztec uh, prophecies spoke of a god with a shiny body and a bearded white face named Quetzalcoatl. Well, according to the Aztec cal calendar, was due to arrive most any day now to reclaim his kingdom. Well, while Moctezuma vacillated, undecided whether to attack these invaders or to welcome them as gods, Cortez, on the other hand, was very decisive. He and his 400 well-armed men wasted no time in conquering some of the local tribes and making allies of others, quickly building a fighting force of two to 300,000. In the fall of 1519, Cortez and his men arrived at the top of a mountain pass several miles to the east of Tenochtitlan, Mexico City. And from that height, they, could, uh, they were able to look down on the magnificent city on the lake. It is said that Tenochtitlan was larger than Rome or Paris and easily more beautiful than any city in Europe. <clears throat> Bernal Diaz, one of uh, Cortez's men, wrote in his diary saying, when we saw all those cities and villages built in the water and other great towns on dry land, and that straight and level causeway leading to Mexico to Nachitlan, we were astounded. It was all so wonderful that I do not know how to describe this first glimpse of things never heard of, seen, or dreamed of before. So there it was laid out before them in all its glory, the fabled El Dorado. All the tales and rumors they had heard back in Spain were true. Spurred on by the sights, the Spaniards wasted no time in their conquests. <clears throat> And Diaz writes again in his diary, we, we came to serve God and get rich as all men wish to do. By 1521, the powerful and brutal Aztec kingdom had been overthrown by the powerful and brutal Spanish conquistadores who built their new Spain on the ruins of the defeated Mexica Aztec Empire. Now keep in mind, this is all happening a hundred years before the pilgrims landed in Plymouth Rock in 1620. By that time, the Spanish empire was well established in Latin America. Indeed, the city where I live, Aguascalientes, Mexico, was founded in 1575. Now let's take a moment and contrast this history with our history. By and large, our forefathers came with their families with hopes to settle down and build a better life free from tyranny. In contrast, the conquistadores trained by centuries of crusade and conquest, were hungry for more. They were adventurers who came to conquer the land for Spain, the souls for Rome, to grab the gold and return home, become gentlemen and retire in luxury. Where our forefathers brought with them the Reformation, the Renaissance, the conquistadores brought with them a medieval religion, 700 years of bloody war and the Inquisition. And the impact of their conquest, this fusion of two cultures, is still felt very deeply today. Joel Morales Cruz, the, uh, in his book, The Mexican Reformation, writes, when the Reformation won peoples and kingdoms for what would be called Protestantism, Spain would see itself as especially chosen by God to preserve the Catholic faith, faith in Europe and to spread it to the millions of people recently discovered across the Atlantic. The lessons learned through centuries of warfare would be used to establish Catholicism at the point of a sword in these Americas to fulfill Spain's own particular brand of manifest destiny. So this was their manifest destiny, sanctioned by Rome, who supplied the indulgences to cover their many transgressions. They saw themselves as holy crusaders with all rights to the spoils of conquest. And conquer they did. They conquered militarily, religiously, economically, and sexually. Again, Dr. Cruz writes, Mexican children learned from an early age that their history was born out of an act of violence of cosmic proportions in which our Spanish forefathers raped our Indian foremothers. And the ruins of pre-Columbian cities and towns stand in silent testimony to that catastrophe. 
the authoritarian and violent nature, nature of Spanish rule and the imposition of Catholicism led to an aversion to the distant and powerful God and drew Mexicans to the maternal virgin of Guadalupe and to the suffering Christ, one might add. So Latinos or Mexicanos pay homage to an indulgent mother and to a suffering Christ. Churches are full on Good Friday and empty on Resurrection Sunday. <clears throat> Geographically, Mexico is right next door, but our cultures, our histories, and our religions are very, very distant. But there is more to Mexican culture than just these things. In spite of its tumultuous history, Mexico is a lively, vibrant society with deep cultural roots. It is a rich mixture of Nat Native American, Spanish, and Moorish with a gilded surface of American consumerism. Besides Spanish, there are over 120 recognized languages spoken in Mexico. Mexico is filled with beautiful cathedrals, palaces, and universities dating back to the 1500s and ancient temples and pyramids, some more than 2,000 years old. Mexico is home to 35 UNESCO World Heritage Sites, including the colonial cities of Guanajuato and San Miguel de Allende. Mexicans are a proud people. They're proud of their heritage, and they're very deeply patriotic. They're not patriotic towards the government, but to the land. You see, the land belongs to them, and they belong to the land. Mexicans are hardworking, and they're very industrious, but, they're, but they also value relationships and status. They love position, and they love living life. Lunch with friends and dinner with family can sometimes be as important as finishing the job on time. And Mexico is changing. As I said, Mexicans generally refer to themselves as Guadalupanas, paying homage to Maria Guadalupe, the patrona, or patron mother of Mexico. But this is much more a cultural or unpatriotic meme than actual reality. More and more peop young people see little value in Catholicism or in attending mass. They're not angry with the church. They just don't see the point. And they're hungry. They're hungry for something the Catholic Church has not delivered. In his book, Manana, Justo Gonzalez writes, among Hispanics, there is a growing tendency towards radical secularization. This is not due to the difficulties with which theologians often deal, but rather with the difficulty that the gospel of love is not translated into actual good news. So how do we approach this cultural, cultural chasm and learn to relate to our neighbors to the South and to those moving North? Well, number one, we begin with a desire to understand and appreciate their culture. And number two, we develop a willingness to examine and challenge our own assumptions. DJ Schwitz in his book, Reciprocal Missions writes, an assumption that typically comes up that we should that we should address goes like this. Someone will say, oh, they are so happy, even though they have so little. Schwitz writes, I challenge this assumption by asking, do we really know these people well enough to understand if they are truly happy with what they have? Or are we making an assumption based on a brief interaction with them? Indeed, do we truly understand or, or do we just simply draw convenient conclusions based on our assumptions? G.K. Chesterton family famously wrote, the tourist sees what he comes to see. The traveler sees what he sees. And it's my personal experience that young Mexican adults, both here and in their own country, they are, they're hungry. Though they may hang on to it culturally, the pra uh, in practice they have abandoned the religion of their mothers and are looking for meaning in their lives. And they're listening. And it but it takes time, it takes time to get behind that smile, earn the confidence and build relationships. But if we can express an understanding and an appreciation for them and their culture, I think, we'll, I think we'll all find that our Mexican friends are much more open than we thought. Well, I hope that by, that, uh, by sharing with you this brief overview of Mexican history and culture, that you'll leave with a little bit better appreciation and understanding of our neighbors to the South and a desire to learn more. 
If you have any questions or comments, please contact me at the, at the uh, email on the screen. I would love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Lord bless.